here we go. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Natalie Jektorowicz and I'm president of the Board of Education. Our meeting tonight was convened at 6.30 and the board has been in executive session since that time and has just come out to join our public meeting. We are once again meeting virtually and this enables a large number of our community to take part in tonight's meeting. Just as we did last meeting, we will once again, be giving audience members the ability to address the board directly as live participants. When we get to audience comments, I'll give everyone a reminder about how that will work. As always, I'm joined tonight by my fellow board members, Jim Baumstark, John Hagee, Katie Jones, Scott Nelson, Mike Corman, and Diane Stefani. Also joining us tonight is our administrative team, including Superintendent Dr. Dane Deli, Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning, Dr. Matt Silverman, Assistant Superintendent for Business Services, Eric Miller, Executive Director of Human Resources, Dr. Heather Hopkins, Executive Director of Student Services, Mary Garrity, Executive Director for Instructional Innovation, Brian Engel, Director of Communications and Strategic Planning, Kathy Kajigian, Director of Operations, Steve Ruelli, Director of EL Bilingual Programs, Raquel Kim. Assistant Director for Student Services, Sir, Student Services excuse me, Kristen Cassieras. District Nurse, Kathleen Lean. And our Board Recording Secretary, Kathy Siegel. I mean, Katie Siegel, I'm sorry, Katie Siegel. Before we dive into tonight's agenda, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge an anniversary. A year ago this week, voters in our community overwhelmingly passed a referendum that will not only improve every one of our school buildings, but will also allow us to offer full day kindergarten and enhance the educational programming at every grade level. This was truly a historic moment for our community. The board remains deeply grateful for the support from our community members and, for, and to all those members of the referendum committee and those who worked tirelessly to pass the referendum. At the time, we were not able to celebrate this, that moment in person due to the onset of the pandemic, but we have not forgotten and we will plan something in the very near future. In the meantime, you will begin to hear about details about the referendum projects as we get closer to breaking ground on construction in the very near future. All right, now let's proceed with our meeting. The first item on our agenda is approvals. We have two items for consideration. The first is the approval of tonight's agenda. Board, may I have a motion and second to approve tonight's agenda? So moved, so moved. Jim Bonskirk. Second, Diane Stefani. All right, this is a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Next, we need a motion and second to approve the February 22nd, 2020, 21 regular and executive board meeting minutes. May so I move, John Hagee. Second, Katie Jones. And this is again a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So that brings us to the communication portion of tonight's agenda, and we begin with superintendent comment, comments. So I will turn it over to Dr. Deli. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I would like to announce this evening that the search process for the next Lions School principal has ended and that the employment offer uh, has been made and accepted by Mrs. Stephanie Scheffler. And Stephanie is currently the assistant principal at Glen Grove Elementary School. And she is no stranger to District 34 after also serving as assistant principal at Westbrook School and as an instructional coach at both Pleasant Ridge and Glen Grove schools, as well as having served as a teacher at both Lyon and Glen Grove schools. So um, we welcome Stephanie back to Lyon in her new role as principal, which will begin for the next school year. And I offer my uh, congratulations and the entire leadership team uh, is, uh, stands ready to help support you in your transition over to Lyon. And I wanted to make that, that public announcement. So thank you for that. Th those are my comments for this evening. Thank you. All 
Uh, yes, we'd like to add our congratulations and best wishes to Stephanie as well. So thank you, Dr. Daly. Next, we have audience comments. This is the first of two opportunity for audience comments. Anyone wishing to address the board can submit their comments using a link found on our district website. Our director of communications, Kathy Kajigian, will read your name and your connection to the district and then bring you on screen. Please make sure your full name is visible on the Zoom because she needs to be able to find you among all participants. As has always been the case, you will have three minutes to speak and you will get a 30, min 30 second warning before hitting that three minute mark. And then we will have to move on to the next speaker. Please know that the board will be taking note of all comments but will not be responding tonight. We will be in listening mode only. The board or administration will follow up with answers either via email or by posting information online if appropriate. We ask that you register one time per each opportunity given and we also ask all speakers conduct themselves with respect, respect and civility as outlined in board policy, section two, subsection 230 and sub section eight, subsection 30. Kathy, are you ready? Yes, we only have um, one person who wishes to comment. So I will bring on Nanette Ross Meredith. Thank you. she is. We see your square, but we can't hear you. Thanks for joining us. How about now? Yes, we can hear you. Go I ahead. Show my face. Oh, yeah. thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Nanette Ross Meredith, president of the Glenview Education Association and the math interventionist at Pleasant Ridge School. I'm speaking on behalf of our membership when I thank all of the parents, PTA, GEF, and administration for their support as we work each and every day to provide all of the children's district's children a quality, safe, and emotionally supportive education in District 34. For those of you who do not know the Glenview Education Association, we are the teachers of your children or your neighbor's children their mentors, their emotional support during the school day, and so much more. Our work spans decades, our members are dedicated professionals, and we always put the children first. We are also human beings with families of our own. We are sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, granddaughters, and grandsons. We want to be safe and keep our families safe, just as all of you do. We work within the parameters set by the administration and the Board of Education. We do not make the policies. Our union is just that, a union of dedicated professionals who have chosen the work of the heart to teach children. We may not always agree with the administration or Board of Education on all things. So when those areas of disagreement occur, we work as one, united as a teacher's union to come to an agreement. We appreciate being treated with the same respect that we provide you your children, and the community. We teach our students to be examples of good character. We look forward to continuing to experience the same going forward. May everyone experience health and happiness in the coming days, months, and years. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Nan. We appreciate your, your feedback. So Kathy, I take it there's nobody else waiting in line at this moment? Okay, good, then we are going to continue. Um, the next item on our agenda is consideration of resolution, also known as our consent agenda. These are items that are either routine in nature or have been previous, previously discussed by the board. Tonight, we have six items on consent. We have resolution 2156, the personnel report, 2157, approval of payroll warrants, 2158, approval of vendor warrants, 2159, staffing allocations, uh, I am, my papers are order, out of order. I'm sorry, just bear with me one moment. Uh, you have four on consent and two on consideration of other resolutions. Thanks, Kathy. So um, that, those were all the consent um, items. I said we had four, six items on consent. We actually have four. I've read all four of them. Um, and so therefore I will ask for a motion and a second to approve those four resolutions on our consent agenda. 
So moved, Jim Baumstark. Second, Katie Jones. All right, this is a roll call vote. Katie, will you take the roll? Sorry. <laughs> Baumstark? Aye. Jones? Aye. Corman? Aye. Peggy? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Stefani? Aye. Jack Torowitz. Aye. All right, motion carries, thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is consideration of other resolutions. And first we have a resolution authorizing the honorable dismissal of teachers and the reduction in hours of teachers. This resolution will honorably dismiss the following teacher from employment in the district at the end of the current school year for reduction in force reasons. Sarah Dallow. The following teacher will be honorably dismissed as a part-time teacher at the end of the 2020-2021 school term and reduced to a lesser part-term teaching position for the 2021-2022 school term for reduction in force reasons. Elizabeth Verish Dirt. Heather, do you have anything to add about these, about this resolution? I think you're muted. Only that it's always our intent to be able to rehire all of our staff. And this truly was uh, all about numbers. Um, these staff members have done themselves well and, and should be proud of their work in District 34. And we hope to see them back in the future. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, may I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 2160, honorable dismissal and reduction of hours of teachers. So moved, John Hagee. Second, Scott Nelson. All right, this is another roll call vote. I think you're muted, Katie. Nelson. Aye. Corman. Aye. Jack Torowitz. Aye. Jones. Aye. Stefani. Aye. Peggy. Aye. Tom Stark. Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. Thank you, Katie. Um, next, we have elimination of position. This is to eliminate the network manager position and will be accompanied by a reduction in force of the staff member currently in the position, Kelly Conwell, as discussed in closed session. Heather, do you have anything else to add on at this point? Only that we are looking at the, the reason for the elimination of the position is because of uh, Brian Engel's look to what the needs of the department are and what the district needs. And that's greater security um, oversight so that he has staff who are responsible for the security of information as well as our systems. And so that's what will be replacing this position. Okay. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, may I have a motion and a second to adopt the elimination of position. So moved, John Hagee. Second, Jim Baumstark. This is a roll call vote. Nelson. Aye. Stefani. Aye. Baumstark. Aye. Peggy. Aye. Jack Torowitz. Aye. Jones. Aye. Foreman. Aye. A motion carries, thank you. Uh, and that brings us to the discussion section of tonight's agenda. And we begin with an adapted in-person update. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Daly once again. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone. We do have a presentation we would like to walk through with you that uh, serves to update on uh, where we are with our move to adapted in-person. Uh, we believe that most of the information that is contained within this presentation, uh, uh, people should not find as new uh, because we have, we've shared much of this information already. However, we, we do understand that for some of these items, uh, you know, seeing or hearing something more than once could be beneficial and sometimes a little bit of narration helps. We, we will not dwell on any 
particular aspect of this, but would rather uh, uh, try to, uh, through some breadth, do some review of, of where things are heading uh, pretty soon here. Uh, it'll be shortly after spring break when, um, when we can uh, really, again, welcome back any uh, children whose uh, uh, families wish to see them in school uh, uh, on a full-time basis. So uh, with that, why don't we um, go to the next slide. So since the time of our last meeting, uh, and actually pretty recently, if you, if you uh, look here, we do have new guidance from ISBE and IDPH. Um, uh, some of this information is, is the same. There is obviously one element to this that's very different, but masks continue to be a requirement. Um, and I, I foresee that to continuing to be a requirement for some time. The distancing, however, uh, is most notably different. So we were working under guidance that said six feet or as much as possible. Uh, the distancing guideline now has been reduced to between three and six feet, uh, which actually coincides uh, well with the work that we've been doing the past couple of weeks and supports our plan uh, for adapted in person quite well. Uh, however, at lunch, when masks are off and children are eating, uh, we will maintain a six foot distance between uh, children. Uh, that will be done in a variety of ways. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. Uh, unvaccinated staff must remain six feet away and our classroom environments are set up such that uh, that can be accomplished. Uh, it also confirms the guidance and the guidance update, uh, some of the importance of what we're already doing. So contact tracing and quarantining for close contacts will continue. The daily self-assessments will continue. Our cleaning and sanitizing protocols will, uh, will continue. Um, we, we have increased uh, outside airflow to 50% of outside air, and that is cycled uh, around five times per hour. So that's something that happens on an, uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, we uh, have staggered and monitored playground use, which we can talk a little bit more about, but on a class by class basis with certain protocols in place, uh, we believe we can safely have individual classes of students at a time uh, using outdoor playground equipment. And then we'll also have a, a review and refresher on the travel quarantine. So we'll elaborate on many of these throughout the presentation. Thank you, Kathy. So we will continue um, with health and safety being our number one priority. And we'll continue the same safety protocols that have worked very well for us throughout this year. It will be an um, expectation that all people entering the building will conduct a daily self-assessment. Um, we need to be patient as students are entering the building. They will need to be scanned in as they are now. But with more students present each and every day, the lines will be longer. We have added some new check um, in stations. Um, and we do need some staff volunteer help in order to, to have that happen. On the bus, the um, 50 students is still the requirement on the bus, but more children may choose to take the bus um, at this time. So that means less distancing. They will have assigned seats and they will be required to wear masks at all times. So when we look inside the classroom, we have talked extensively over the year about the six foot indicator, basically between children or desks or however you like to envision a classroom. So right now we would actually depend on enrollment and the size of the classroom, most likely resulting in less than six feet as we lay out the rooms and look at the enrollment and the size of the classroom. The other key indicator is teachers will indeed have a six foot designated um, teaching area uh, for them to interact with both in direct instruction and then opportunities to uh, move within that six feet for the lessons and follow-up support. And I didn't hit you. We wanted to provide um, real quick, just an update from the try three to the adaptive adapted in-person numbers. As you can see on here, um, there was minimal change as it relates to the whole district, but we had 84 switching to in-person at middle school, 19 switching to goal, which is a net addition of 65 between the two buildings. Um, so about 
32 per building. Um, at the EC5 level, we had 46 switch to in-person, six switch to goal, which is again a net um, difference of 40, which is 6.6 .6 per school or 2.2 per grade per building. Um, there was no need for classroom or teacher redistribution um, moving forward. So when we think about movement and we look at movement and the classrooms that are being established right now, in general, now again, it will depend on the classroom size, uh, the enrollment and the size of the, the physical space. But in general, this notion of limited movement uh, between uh, the desks or the, the um, aisle or whatever the classroom creation looks like. Similarly, when we look at the student interactions, um, there'll be a limited sort of design around those as well. But more importantly, this notion of movement breaks is gonna be critical throughout the day, as well as actually um, the opportunity to take a mask break um, uh, during those movement breaks and uh, take advantage of the out outdoor time and the tents. In terms of fine arts, you'll see there that we have come to the design of early childhood through second grade, moving children moving to the fine arts classrooms. And then for our intermediate buildings, third through fifth, fine arts teachers come to the classrooms to deliver their content area and experiences for children. And then that last indicator, PE outside today, uh, I guess with a snowstorm, that would be a challenge, but hopefully uh, maybe is this the last one. And so then of course we'd use the gym space for physical education. So similar to EC5, um, the 6-8 model is not like the um, pre-pandemic classroom. However, um, we will be having um, limited movement within the classroom during a class period. Cohorts of students will be moving between um, periods, between um, classes together. Students will wipe dust down upon entering the class. Um, teachers will be staying, unlike in the hybrid model they currently have, teachers will be staying in their classroom. And similar to our EC5 classrooms for PE, when possible, um, it's gonna be outside or in the gyms um, with large space. So when we think about band, orchestra, choir, music, uh, the band, orchestra, choir is referred to in the middle schools as, as BOC, and then music or general education music classes for our children. When we talk about band and orchestra, we will be able to deliver one uh, um, single lesson format for children and small group lessons, so one-on-one -on -one and small group lessons. We did purchase and continue to match the specialized masks that allow for air to flow but keep the safety factor when playing such as a trumpet or another instrument that would also require a bell cover. So we're really looking at the instruments and ensuring that both the um, general CDC and Illinois Department of Public Health safety factors as well as from these professional organizations that our teachers belong to in terms of their recommendations. And then the six foot distancing factor is actually key when we are looking at band and orchestra. For the middle school band orchestra choir BOC, uh, we will be starting up morning overture, which is the before school um, rehearsal time. Again, it will be uh, limited to the small group opportunity to access uh, more children with their band director or orchestra conductor. And we will look at uh, April 12th to start that. The last element, general music classes or music classes um, beyond band orchestra choir, we will be singing, which is incredibly exciting and an opportunity for our children with the mask on. And then non -instru wind instruments will be utilized. Um, same protocols, same safety opportunities when we think about physical education uh, apparatus and those types of things. So all of this has been established to make sure that children are engaging in music throughout their week with their teacher and really enjoying the experience. When it comes to lunch, we've got some uh, great flexibility in the fact that the district participates in the National School Lunch Program. So uh, taking orders from the classroom, providing free meals to any students who may uh, uh, like a meal uh, can do so at no charge. And we're gonna continue throughout this all in uh, to provide uh, students who continue to be remote, a weekly pickup uh, every Wednesday out of Springman in the later, later hours of the, the afternoon and early evening. 
uh, as we discussed last last uh, a month, you know, we think it's important, and so does the the guidance that dictate that students, when they have meal time, they take their mask off, and they maintain six feet uh, distance. And to help with this, we're providing a divider for every student, depending on where they may end up uh, eating lunch. We'll, we'll guarantee that six feet distance with the divider as well. So what we did in um, over the last couple of months for the middle schools, we, we're delivering lunches to uh, centralized locations. And we're going to do something similar, but for first and fifth, we're going to deliver lunches to the classroom. So um, we, we figured out how to disseminate uh, staff so that they can uh, make sure those lunches get to where the kids are going to be eating. And uh, as we mentioned last month, we, we are asking that uh, both the students and the staff uh, sort out how they can wipe down their area both before and after lunch um, so that those areas are clean as they, as they eat. When it comes to the outdoors, similar uh, to the past, we provided a tent or two, sort of depending on how um, the sites lay out with construction coming up. But um, we do plan on having tents uh, installed again uh, soon here. And then also new guidance has allowed for playground use um, on a rotating basis, not too many kids at one time, but we think that'll be nice also for, uh, for mass breaks and uh, when kids are outside for recess. When it comes to cleaning and air circulation, similar to what we've done before, and well, this says more students equals more space to clean, and that's true. So, um, you know, our, our, our additional custodial staff will continue to clean high touch areas as much as they can. However, with lunch and all the number of students that are going to be there, again, we, we ask that students and staff use sanitizing wipes or sprays to, uh, to continue to clean before and after they eat. And now as it relates to ventilation, you know, and working with the district's uh, engineers, what we figured out is that we can uh, manipulate the system in order to bring in about 50% outside air, which is ideal and provides for five air exchanges per hour so that air is constantly rotating out. And then we have put in MERV 8 and 13 filters on some of the units that we have throughout the buildings. And with quarantines, um, we'll continue to um, make use of our fabulous um, contact tracers in all of the buildings who have been um, consistent in their work uh, throughout this year. Um, they may be working a little bit more because with less distance, there's more potential close contacts. So um, we're going to be updating our conversations with our contact tracers to make sure that we've got those processes in place for our new environment. Um, and the shortened quarantine is not allowed um, in environments with less than six feet distance, though we may have some more clarification from the Cook County of Department of Public Health um, on that issue. But we know that there's no quarantine required for those who are fully vaccinated or um, within 90 days of um, testing positive for COVID-19. The travel quarantines, we will follow the CDC guidance for international travel. Um, and we'll follow the Cook County Department of Public Health guidance for domestic travel. We'll have all of that information on our website. It's currently there and we're sending out communication to families um, on Wednesday of this week in advance of spring break to clarify that. Um, and we'll continue to communicate this information to families, but it's um, always on our website under health and safety protocols. Um, Again, there's no quarantines for close contacts or after travel for staff who are fully vaccinated. Um, there are no vaccines for kids, so that does not apply. Um, but they have to remain without symptoms and following strict masking, even after being fully vaccinated, which is two weeks um, after their second dose or two weeks after the single dose vaccine. We have um, shared with staff that the vaccine is required and given all of the benefits of the vaccine, and as we see the changes in restrictions for those that are fully vaccinated, it just adds more information to why having our staff fully vaccinated makes sense for us and, and meets our obligation to provide a safe environment for everyone. Um, and so we are, um, Kathy has been a, a miracle worker in identifying options for staff in terms of all of the various 
um, locations and types of vaccinations that people can get and has been working really hard to daily provide staff with that information so they can be fully vaccinated. Our target date is the end of April that everyone would be in process if not fully vaccinated. And we do believe that by keeping all of our adults safe while they're at school or any building that they work in, that we will then have a much more successful adapted in-person experience because we'll have our, safe, our staff in the buildings with children. You've heard from uh, Eric that we do need more hands because there's more bodies coming back to our buildings. Uh, some little bodies and then some very big bodies. And so what we need to do is, um, again, to help ensure safety is make sure that these four areas have the appropriate amount of supervision. Arrival at school, as you know, um, involves also checking that students have completed their or their parents have completed for them, their um, health self-assessment, also, when students are in the hallways, we want to make sure that they are maintaining social distancing as much as possible. For lunch recess, supervision is obviously need, uh, needed to keep students safe. And for dismissal, again, watching that distancing and making sure that students are able to exit the building safely. So these are great opportunities for community members and parents who have identified that they would be more than happy to help us with these, with these tasks. And so, you will see online tomorrow on our website under the HR department on our uh, HR's homepage, so to speak, you will see an opportunity to become a volunteer. So there will be an interest form for you to complete and we'll also give you more information about each of these tasks that you can volunteer for. You can volunteer for any of them, all of them. You will also give us your availability both days of the week as well as various time um, ranges that we put in the survey so that we can match up the need with the buildings. And we, um, it, the need varies by building. So it may or may not match what you're able to do or where your preference is to volunteer, but we will do our best to make sure that everyone who wants to help us uh, can. So it's important that we offer a smooth transition. Although our buildings have been open and our children have been coming, only half of them have been coming at a given time. They haven't had the opportunity to have their full class. We know that students learn best when they feel safe, secure, and connected. So we have partnered once again with Doug Bolton. He will provide our staff on um, April 5th, that Monday, with an all staff, including all associates who work with our children, a professional, develop, professional development opportunity on helping staff understand the importance of building resiliency and the importance of classroom communities. From there, he um, will also present um, in the evening for our families um, on 4 or 5. More information will be coming. Um, for that. This week of celebration, we will weave throughout our day um, opportunities for helping children connect, take breaks, and identify their feelings. Um, some of the themes will be on building community, connecting with emotions, movement activities, mindfulness um, activities. The goal is to help our children reacclimate to the school routines in a positive way. And to make sure that um, parents have all the information they need to support their students and um, to get their students um, to school when they need to. We'll continue those daily reminders to do the self-assessment. Um, we'll continue with updates of the website and posts on social media and direct emails to parents um, for the information that you need to know moving into adapted in person. All right, that was a lot of really good information. I just want to thank all of you for the amount of work that you've done in the three weeks since we last met and gave you direction uh, to make plans for uh, having students in buildings five days a week. And in three weeks, you have done a tremendous amount of work as is reflected in this presentation. So I thank all of you. And I just also wanna point out that this is gonna take place on April 7th 
a week before the deadline that we gave you. So you did not drag your heels and I appreciate that. And um, you gave us a lot of really good information. I particularly really like all the um, support that parents and staff are gonna get in transitioning kids back to uh, going to school five days a week. Um, all of us have sort of gotten comfortable with being in our pajamas on the couch, doing what we need to do, but it's time we get back to the normal way of doing things to the extent that we can. And I'm also really want to, I want to point out that, and what is gratifying for me and I'm sure for my board members is the new guidance is completely in line with the direction that we gave you. And so you, it kind of actually gave you a week and a half head start on this planning and it kind of positions us pretty well for the end of the school year. So anyway, all of that is one big thank you to all of you. Uh, and having said that, I'm gonna open it up to questions from my fellow board members. Does anybody have any questions right now? Well, you guys are uncharacteristically quiet. Um, I'm just going to tap dance a little bit because I have a feeling maybe somebody might have a question if they think about it. I, I also want to point out, um, Kathy, thank you for um, pointing out that there'll be on the website guidance for after spring break because we are going to be moving into this adapted in person pretty quickly after spring break. And I know that it's going to be very helpful for parents to have that resource available to see exactly what they should be doing. And I will be checking that out myself. So I see that Scott and Mike have their hands up. I'm gonna to go to Scott first and then Mike. I don't wanna get ahead of myself too much, but uh, the this uh, gives us a better clue as to maybe next fall could be uh, similar to what we're looking at right now as far as mitigation strategies, but school open. I, I'm sorry, Scott, what I... I'm just trying to make sure that people see that uh, we're moving to adapted in person right now and our plan for the fall would probably maintain that situation or improve on it. Is that correct? Yes. I, I mean, the guidance as it exists now allows us to achieve the objective of making this offer available to families to, to make a choice. Um, given the, the migration pattern that we, we saw during this last open enrollment period, if you will, it still leaves us room to um, be, be able to do something potentially different in the, in the fall. The guidance from ISBE will be important in terms of the, um, the full remote option. Um, so, you know, the question about whether goal exists in the fall is kind of an open question at this point where we're planning as if um, that's an option that can be made available. But in terms of the mitigations, yeah, it's uh, we'll, we'll follow the guidance. It's been relaxed to the point where we can get more children back. But you know, there's some best practice, I think, that really needs to continue. So when you think about things like just you know, air quality. When you when you think about cleaning protocols, when you think about having a a, a quarantine area um, that's separate from the regular nurses' office. I mean, those are good, just best practice elements that I think we've learned from this pandemic that I see us carrying into the fall. Okay, Mike. Um, so just, uh, I guess, quick three quick three quick thoughts. Um, one is I want to thank everyone uh, in the administration. I know that President Jack Torowitz did, but I definitely want to thank um, the administrators and the teachers for working as hard as you have to um, make, make the vision that the board have come to fruition. And uh, I know it's been an incredible amount of work, and I hope that the people that are participating online are not taking the lack of questions as anything other than a, a thorough endorsement of what uh, we've seen over the course of the last several weeks uh, and the last few months as we've worked a plan. We had a plan, we've worked a plan. So I just want to thank everybody for that. Um, in terms of the last two months uh, or, or more in the buildings, I just uh, would like to reinforce something I think I stated last month, which is we have a very unique opportunity to tap into understanding the gaps for various children 
that occurred since we were last in the buildings a year ago. And I hope that we will have a, a thoughtful uh, process for assessing, uh, for teachers to be able to assess kids that uh, maybe struggled with grades, but we know they're smart kids, or uh, maybe they, they did very well in, in this environment. Now they're switching back to a, a, um, a more traditional format. And that we think about those things on a per child basis, because if one thing I've heard throughout this last year, if you have you know three, four or five kids in the district, each one of them is different and each one of them took this differently. And I, and I really hope we have an opportunity here to uh, launch into the fall uh, with, with a very well thought out um, platform for each student. We, we have an exceptional district with exceptional teachers and exceptional staff, exceptional administrators, and aside from me, exceptional board members. And I really hope that we can uh, dive forward uh, into fall 2021. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, anybody else? All right. I think is oh, Katie. Let's go to Katie. I just want to put in a quick plug since I know I was somebody who was kind of pleading for the use of volunteers. I know we have a wonderful community that's full of people that um, are willing to give up their time. So. Um, now here's your opportunity and the teachers and the administration have done their part and I think we need to do ours. So anybody who has any time available, please um, fill out that form and volunteer your time because um, th they've all made this work and we need to we need to come halfway. So thank you. All right, Katie, thank you for that. I'm hoping you'll accept a board member or two as volunteer as well. Um, I don't think we have any additional comments at this point. So I think we will move on to um, the rest of our discussion agenda. And we have two transportation contract amendments. One is for Alltown for the fiscal year 2022, and one is with Safeway for fiscal year 2021, 2020 through 2023. And I'm gonna to turn to Eric Miller and I'm gonna ask Eric if you wanna take these individually or if you wanna talk about them at the same you, time. If you don't mind, I'll take them individually and, and neither will be, will be very long. Um, when it comes to all town, you know, the district first went out to bid and engaged in the contract with them mid 2014. And, and by law, uh, when you conduct a bid for transportation services, you can do a three year term and if you like their services, you can renew for another two. And then it's annually, um, unless the district decides they'd like to go out to bid or if, if there's a challenge uh, that comes forward for, for, uh, for us to actually go out to bid. Just a note, in, in recent years, the laws have changed and the district, the board no longer has to award the contract if we were to go out to bid to the lowest bidder uh, because now there's a recognition of, of service, um, a familiarity with the district, the kids, things like that, just, just so uh, the board and community are aware. We feel as though um, our relationship with All Town has been good uh, and continues to be good. And so uh, we engage in this conversation to renew for, for a one-year term, uh, like you said, through uh, FY22. And the terms that, have, that are being proposed tonight is for a 3.6% increase in regular routes um, uh, for All Town for next year. <clears throat> All right, does anybody have any questions? That's a quick one. Yeah. Um, so Eric, you're, you're saying that there was, because of the no requirement for the competitive bid, there was not like, there was not a bid process as part of this, right? It was just a review of the existing contract and an assessment that it, the, the service has been good and the price increase is reasonable. So therefore we'll move ahead with an extension. Exactly, and, and just for frame, this is, you know, typically we've seen a 5.5% increase with all town. And so um, actually 3.6 is, is very fair, reasonable. And I think it's an acknowledgement for how the board treated all town this past year as well. I just wasn't sure the way you teed it up made it sound like maybe we got competitive bids and you just happened to choose one, you stuck with this one because of the service component. No, that would be, a, uh, I would have uh, sort of brought that to the board and no, we did not go out to bid. This was just a, a renegotiation for next That's year. what I thought, I just wanted to yeah. confirm, thank you. I just was uh, giving some some background to the bid process and making sure everyone was familiar with um, what could be done and how it could be handled in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I think we can move on to talk about Safeway. 
So Safeway, <clears throat> if you if you recall, this is we just finished our first three year term with Safeway. Uh, when we first um, accepted the bids with Safeway, I, I think there was an acknowledgement that there was a, a reduction in sort of the, the the per route fee compared to to the market. And in addition, Safeway did not increase their rates to the district for a three year period, which was is pretty much unheard of. And when we engaged in the conversation about a two year renewal uh, for Safeway, who is actually rather rather new as a business, I think realized that they um, underbid too low and that wasn't sustainable for them. So what they pitched to, to the district is a 105% increase on the annual spend. And if you're like me, that sounds like a lot. And so you, you pause for a moment and you, you look around and you see that in comparison to what districts are looking at for, for next year, uh, this, even the 105% increase is actually 30% below the average of what an MSSED, Deerfield 109, districts like that are paying. So while it sounds high, I think we got a really good bargain uh, for the last three years. And that uh, while 105% sounds high, it's actually still below market. I know Mary and Steve and Rob would all agree that we think they do a, a really nice job for the district, for our kids, and uh, especially students who have, you know, who have special needs. And it, it's sort of nice to have that same driver if we can maintain that, that, um, that staffing level. And in addition, uh, part of the rationale for the increase is um, Safeway uh, has a bus bar now in Wheeling. So they're gonna try and attract a more local driver, pay a higher wage and offer some uh, benefit package that would remain competitive because drivers are still still short. So while it's a, it's a sizable increase, I think all things considered, uh, it's a proposal I'm, I'm comfortable making with the board. Okay, any questions from the board? All right. Not it, that's a quick question. In, in the draft budgets we've been looking at for next year, was this contemplated or is this going to be like a need to be factored in? This needs to be factored in. And, and that's a good point. You know, just just as another reminder, another piece of this, you know, uh, historically, the Illinois State Board of Ed has reimbursed the district 80 percent for all specialized transportation costs. So if this were true, the exposure would only be about one hundred thousand dollars more that's not offset by, by revenue. So. Um, no, it will be incorporated into the draft budget you see in there. Okay, that's good to know. Good question. All right, I think we can move on to our final discussion item, which is the following meeting agenda. And just a quick note, uh, we have added a special board meeting for March 29th for the sole purpose of approving bids for phase one summer construction work on our referendum projects. Um, and so that will be our next meeting. Board members, do you have any questions about the following meeting agenda? All right, seeing none, we come to the second and final opportunity for audience comments. I would again like to remind everyone wishing to register comment that they may do so using a link on our website. We ask that you identify yourself and your connection to the district. You have three minutes to speak and you will get a 30 minute warning, a 30 second warning, excuse me. And we will be in listening mode only, and, but you will get a response in a timely manner. And we ask that everyone conduct themselves with respect and civility. Kathy, do we have any additional comments at this time? We do not have any comments. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so that brings us to our reports. We have four reports tonight, the FOIA report, a budget status report, current year financial projections, and the referendum expense report. Do we have any questions about any of these reports? All right, seeing none, I will ask the board if they, oh, Scott, I see your hand up. Sorry, Eric, I was wondering, is there any more clarification since the uh, new uh, COVID Relief Act was passed of what kind of uh, additional funds we may see. I don't know if it, it, it's come through at all yet. It, it did. We got official word from ISBE that the ESSER 2, E-S-S-E-R, don't ask me what it stands for, 2, that second round, this is following the CARES Act. So the first, the initial tranche was 366000 And for ESSER 2, while we initially had heard 1.2, we've now heard 1.4 million. And uh, there's even rumors about some additional money that, that may 
be in the works as well. So um, all, all good news. Thank you. And I'm sure you'll give us an update when you know more about that. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, so then I will ask the board if anybody has any other business that they would like to bring forward tonight. Seeing none, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn tonight's meeting? So moved, John Nagy. Seconded, Mike Corman. All right, this is a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We're adjourned. And I wish everyone a happy and safe St. Patrick's Day. And we'll see you on March 29th. Everybody have a happy spring break as well. Take care. Good night. <laughs>